authentic, real self. How was your How was your night at Legacy Night here? It was amazing. Um, how was your night here, here at, let me pray for at you. Legacy Night? Come here, let me pray for you. How was your night here at Legacy Night? It was good. It was good. How How did you guys enjoy tonight with Christine Kane? I loved the message. It was very powerful. She made it interesting. How are you? How did you enjoy How did you enjoy tonight's message with Christine Kane? It was really, really good. She's an anointed speaker. She touched me, and now I'm ready to go. What's up, Kenny? How, how did you enjoy tonight's message with Christine Kane? Cool. How the presence of the Lord here. Worship. It's Pastor Julian from Oasis. I want to thank you so much for coming out to Legacy Nights. We loved having you there. Pastor Fernando is becoming such a great friend of mine. And as a church, we support each other and all that God is doing in our churches and want to thank you for coming out. I can't wait to see you guys soon. And hopefully I'll be able to visit your church coming up here soon. Love you guys so much and I'll see you soon. Church, let's do this. Um, I am honored. I am humbled. I am privileged to be here today, this morning, um, to be uh, to allow God to use me as a vessel. It is very uh, humbling. It's very testing. It's very. Uh, it's a privilege. So I count this an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, God has given me a word about the personhood of Jesus. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning: is the personhood of Jesus and how important our Savior really is and who He is. But before we get there, um, I just want to pray uh, for us as a whole, for our families, the protection of our families, and just for our hearts this morning. Um, so if you can allow me to pray, let's pray. Dear Father, I pray this morning for uh, our souls, for our lives, for our minds, and for our hearts, Jesus. That, that you allow us to be open, that you, you speak to us, Father, in a way that is so clear, in a way that is so evident, Father, that it's from you. I pray for our families, God. I pray for our friends. And I pray for this city as well as the whole world that is in your hand, that, that you love so much. I pray just for your power and for your spirit to hover across our nation to hover across our homes uh, for your healing power to do miraculous wonders, Father. And Father, this morning, uh, I just pray once again for our hearts and for our souls to be open to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen. All right, church. Well, hey, before I get into it, uh, I have to say how proud I am of every single one of you who have been tuning in. Um, if you're tuning in live, I, I salute and I have so much props for you because it's a hard thing to do. We thought that was going to be an easy challenge uh, uh, or an easy task. Just log in on your computer live. But being that we are in the comfort of our homes, um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to do so. So we've noticed a lot of people viewing our services um, on demand. So uh, I, I applaud you if you are tuning in live and I applaud you if you're watching demand. So thank you. Uh, I have to give the glory and honor to God for what he's doing in my life, for what he's doing in our church life and our family's life. And by family, I mean my, my, my dad and my mom. Uh, I just want to give credit where credit is due. And that's to my dad. He, if, uh, he's our pastor, uh, Pastor Fernie. I'm his son. I'm Fernie Franco Jr. Um, and I live here at the Thrive House, which is at uh, his house, our pastor's house. We live with uh, it's a total of 12 people and my parents. And we get to see firsthand um, the amount of work that it takes to run this church at this present moment, being that we have to be live at home. It is way harder and way way much effort way more effort and he stays up to three in the morning editing videos all the videos that you see that have edits pre-recorded videos 
he edits most of them. Um, we have a team. I just want to give credit where that's due before I get into it. And our team is, man, um, our sound guys, Manny, Greg, uh, uh, our the home, the, the house, the Thrive House helps us set up. Uh, you know, um, Aaron makes some designs, uh, Jonathan on the guitar, Nikki, Lupita, I, and the worship team, man, I, oh, I miss you so much. I want to worship together. Uh, but during this time, I think we all understand. So credit to those who have been helping on this journey of just this whole pandemic to have church online. So let's get into it, okay? Um, I hope your hearts are open. I hope your mind is open because we are going to be talking about the personhood of Jesus. Sorry about the hat. It, it's uh, I just have a. It says weird life, but I have a weird haircut, so I'm trying to hide that. Um, I feel like I'll show you. I feel like I look like the the guy, the little baby on the lemon head box, the little candy. So uh, it's just uh, that's why I'm wearing a hat, okay? So the personhood of Jesus. Um, what a savior we have that's what i'm learning what a redeemer we have what a messiah what the answer to everything is in the personhood of jesus um and i'd like to begin by maybe comparing it to an analogy or an example that i have and i have been privileged beyond measure to go to some of the craziest coolest places in the world uh ever since i was a kid i've had a fascination and an adoration for rome italy not necessarily the city itself, even though there's so much history. But when you think of Rome and you view it in your mind, what do you see? Yes, the Colosseum. And man, I, I ever since I was a kid, I would dream about being in the Colosseum. My favorite move, my favorite movie was Gladiator. It still is. It's a battle between Apocalypto and Gladiator. Um, but Gladiator. Uh, Russell Crowe playing Maximus in the uh, battling for his freedom after his family was brutally murdered by the emperor um, and battling for freedom in the uh, in the Colosseum. How much of that took place in those days? Uh, Christians were persecuted. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but history. Christians were persecuted. An uh, animal attacks uh, on humans. Um, brutal things. Uh, events, shows, uh, uh, musicals, Broadways, um, uh, speeches, so much has taken place in the Colosseum and that's still standing today. So I've been wanting to see it and on my 18th birthday, I'm 26 right now, on my 18th birthday, uh, we went to Rome and we found ourselves in Rome, Italy and my mom made it happen and we, we went on a bus to go to the Colosseum and I still remember it to this day. I was facing my parents like I'm facing you. The bus is moving this way. Uh, I'm talking to them. And I see something change in their look. My, my dad and my mom. They knew how much I, I wanted to see this. And they know how much I love Rome. And they tell me, hey, Fern, uh, turn around. And as I turn around, I promise you it, it was a movie scene. It was like I heard... So I felt like I was moving in slow motion as I turned and I was like music's playing and it's it's a it's a just theatrical strings horns and out go the curtains and we turn and there it is the Colosseum beautiful at that time on the bus I'm looking and I'm awestruck I can't move it's probably the first time that's ever happened where I was stunned speechless almost even the verge of tears. I'm not like a sensitive, emotional guy, but that moved me. I, I seen it for myself. Uh, I put the history and I saw the fact of the actual existence of the Colosseum. I saw them together. That right there, that building is where all of this history took place. That's what I want to talk about this morning because we find that in the personhood of Jesus Christ. So we're going to turn to a passage. You're not, because you probably don't have your Bible. <laughs> That's not a shot. I'm just kidding. I shouldn't have said that, okay? Because uh, I don't even bring my Bible. I do it off my phone too, so it's. I'm sorry, okay? But we're going to turn uh, to John chapter 21. Uh, and uh, I'll give a little bit of context to the story, okay? This is after Jesus died um, on the cross. He resurrected, 
and he's only made a very short amount of appearances, at least in this book, according to John, where we're going to be at right now. He appeared to Mary already. Uh, Mary went to the disciples, and the disciples were like, oh man, you know, like, wow, you're lucky. Then he appeared to the disciples in the room. Thomas wasn't there, so Thomas was like, ah, you know, I don't know, until I see it, until I see this, the, the marks in his hands and the mark on his side, until I put my fingers. Then he appeared again to the same room with the disciples later on, and Thomas was there, and they seen Jesus, and Thomas saw Jesus firsthand, and they believed. So they knew Jesus is alive. Everything that Jesus has said, because the, 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 the Messiah was not only to be the king, but he was supposed to be the resurrected king as well. So that was a huge, huge uh, accomplishment in prophecy. The biggest that he resurrected. Now that they've seen it with their eyes, they knew this truly is the Messiah. This truly is the Christ. After all that we've seen, after all that we've experienced with Jesus here on earth, now that I see Jesus resurrected again, I mean, resurrected, and I see him again, I believe. I believe. So this is where we're at. He made those appearances, and we're going to see his next appearance, again, to the disciples. Okay? So this is where we're at. John chapter 21. We're going to read a passage. It's a story, so you can lay back and listen. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, the same Thomas that was doubting, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, said Simon Peter. Oh, Simon Peter told him and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large amount of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Probably astonished. It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him because he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. That's going to be important right now. So remember that, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. That's a, a, a beautiful story that we are going to I guess, view the personhood of Jesus in. There's all so much of the personhood of Jesus in this story, of the past, of the future, of the present, that we can probably be here for hours and hours. So I, I was speaking and I was, I was praying to God, God, there's so much in this. I see so many correlations to the past. I mean, think about it. Uh, when Jesus first went to the disciples, that was the same thing. They were fishing. He told them, throw their nets in. And they caught so many fish, their nets broke and their boat began to sink. That was the first experience with the disciples. Think about the, um, he says, come have breakfast. He was, and, they, and then he cooked fish and loaves of bread for them. He had that already prepared. Think about the miracles, about the loaves and the fish. He, there's so much correlation. When, they, when the disciples were in the storm and Jesus appeared to them on the water, and we know that story. Peter was challenged to, to come out of the boat and walk on water. And he came out of the boat. We find Peter coming out of the boat again, but swimming to Jesus. There's so much that we can talk about. 
so much we can talk about, but we're not going to talk about correlations and we're not going to try to prove doctrines. We're not going to try to prove uh, why this is, you know, this is so crazy, but we're going to reveal the personhood of Jesus through these correlations with this passage, okay? So uh, what the Lord was revealing to me was there's, of course, three things. There's always three things. But uh, I was honestly revealed, uh, God revealed three things to me in this passage about the personhood of Jesus. Let's start off with the first one. The personhood of Jesus is beauty. Jesus is a beautiful person. I'm not talking about his physical appearance because we're told do not make idols of, uh, other, uh, don't, don't make any other idols before me. So we're not going to worship the beauty of the physical person of Jesus. We don't even know what he looks like. He could be white. He could be black. He could be brown. He could be whatever. We're not worshiping the idol and the physical being of Jesus. The beautiful character of Jesus is who we're talking about. That's who we're talking about. And to, to, to reveal this in the passage, uh, we're going to talk about that Jesus had something in mind already when he went to reveal himself to the disciples on this passage, he, he had planned to talk to Peter after this. So what did he do? He came, he prepared a breakfast for them. Just like the Last Supper, he prepared breakfast. Now, tell me if you are an, uh, uh, a newlywed couple or a newlywed, I don't know about anything about marriage, I'm not married, but say if you are just in a relationship, isn't that the most romantic time of the relationship? Uh, if you are Mr. Romantic and you are the guy who wants to blow your lady's feet out of the water, uh, most likely you have tried throwing a picnic for her. Um, did it go well? I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I don't know what the conclusion of going well means to you, but. Uh, we see that here. Jesus prepared a picnic, a breakfast for his disciples because he was going to talk to Peter about something very important. Um, but I want to, tell, I want to tell, dial in on a, a, a part of the passage that says, about, it talks about the nets. That when Jesus told the disciples to throw their nets in, that they gathered so much fish, right? And when they came in, it said they had so much fish, but their nets were untorn, why does Luke, this is, I mean, sorry, John, why does John bring that up, that their nets were untorn? Like, what does it have to do with anything? I'll tell you what it has to do with. It's a reference. It's a reference to the first time. Remember, we're going to do some correlation stuff. It's a reference to the beginning when Jesus first told them to do this, and they broke their nets. Their nets were so full that they broke. What does that sound like? Brokenness in the beginning. Then when you come back to the love of Jesus, when you come back to the same encounter with Jesus, when you have a solid structure, something that can't be broken, that's, 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 that's a solid foundation in your, in your, in your, uh, in your um, man, I can't think of the word, but in your belief of Jesus. It can't be broken. Your net cannot be broken. Even if you think about the boat last time, the boat was so full of fish that it began to sink. They didn't, they didn't have the same problem. Their boat was afloat. But if you think about, I'm, I, now I am going to go back. If you think about the sinking boat, their boat was sinking because of the amount of fish that was in it but yet their boat was still sinking. Sometimes we view our life, if it's sinking, we view it in a negative way because it's most likely because of problems. It's most likely because something's not going right. But Jesus views a sinking boat as a blessing. But that wasn't going to be the point of the message here. The boat didn't sink and the nets did not tear, but yet he blessed them with that amount of blessings that you were able to handle, that you and I are able to handle. So what, what, what am I trying to say by this first point? 
Jesus is beautiful in the way that he blesses you. Jesus is beautiful in the way that he prepares you. We weren't as blessed as we were. The disciples weren't as blessed as they were when they first caught the fish because they weren't prepared for that amount of fish. Their nets broke and their their boat sank. But what did they do? They must have strengthened their nets. They must have done some some type of reinforcement to their boat for for them to uh, be able to handle that amount of blessings. Jesus prepared breakfast for them this day. He knew he was going out for a purpose. He knew that these men were going to be hungry. I'm about to drop a bombshell on Peter. I don't want him. I want him to be ready to receive this. Jesus is preparing something for you that you might see as negative. If your boat is sinking, don't view that as a negative. View it as something beautiful. View it as beauty from God, beauty from Jesus. It's easy to talk about the beauty of God because God is our creator. He's the creator of heaven and earth. I can go outside. I can watch a sunset. I can see the stars and I can see the beauty of God. But when we're talking about the person of Jesus, the person, it's hard to see that because it always comes in ways where we view it as ugly, (laughs) A sinking boat, a storm, like when Jesus had Peter walk on the water, Uh, a lack of food when Jesus performed the miracles. It's the beauty of Jesus comes in the form of ugliness and brokenness. And when you choose to receive that, when you choose to believe that, uh, he begins to uh, reinforce your life. He begins to, uh, I guess expose you to his realness because we're going to talk about that so the first thing is the beauty of jesus the person of jesus the beauty the second thing is the love of jesus yes this is evident and it's obvious and we talk about it all the time the love of jesus the love of god the love of jesus i want to go back to the passage uh and i want to talk about how they noticed Jesus. And it was saying, we're going to go to verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, because remember, he was on the beach, uh, he was on the shore. He wasn't in the form of Jesus as they normally see him, or else they would have realized, they would have recognized him. They did not recognize him. He even spoke to them, and they still didn't recognize him. So he must have had a different appearance and a different voice. But the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, and he jumped into the water. What is this about love? What does this teach us about love? It teaches us about love because when when you love Jesus, you are able to see Jesus. The same, let's go back, correlation, okay? The same thing in the beginning. When they're boat began to sink and their nets began to break they didn't see jesus for who he was they thought he was a teacher and a master but they didn't see him peter didn't get out of the boat and swim to this guy and say who are you no but john he noticed once their nets he's like this is jesus this is jesus this is the lord and when he told that to peter peter has such a love for jesus remember peter just denied Peter denied Jesus three times do you think that he has regret in his heart at this time I strongly do because at least in the book of John there's no talk about reconciliation about you denied me Peter they didn't have that yet so they haven't had that conversation according to John so Peter with the love he has for Jesus jumps out of the boat swims a hundred yards in the water to meet his Messiah that he knows is truly the Messiah. Love, when you can see Jesus, your love will grant you the desire to pursue him or do anything for him. Because let's go back. When you love Jesus, you can see Jesus, right? And when you can see Jesus, Your heart 
is going to pound and be like, oh, this is Jesus. You know what? This is this is Jesus. I know this is Jesus. It may not look like him. It may not sound like him, but this is Jesus. This is my Lord. This is my Savior. And if I'm going to view this situation, if I'm going to view this negative situation as Jesus, then I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what I have to believe. I don't care what I may even have to think or tell people. But I'm going to pursue the fact that I believe this is Jesus. Just like Peter did. Peter got a major blessing out of this. Uh... What was the blessing? I'll tell you. The Bible will tell you. When they were eating breakfast, it says after they ate. In John, same thing, chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Uh, He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then right here, Jesus reinstates Peter as the head of the church and as the rock. And he says, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead and lead you where you don't want to go. He was actually talking about Peter's death there. But he instated, he reinstated him there as, you know what? Feed my sheep then. You are going to be head of the church. That's not what the point of that, that the person of Jesus, that's not the point right there of, of being Peter being reinstated. But the point is that Jesus loved Peter so much, he gave him a chance, an opportunity to not repent, but to try once more. He denied Jesus three times to clean to cover the ugliness of Peter's past, his regret, his conviction, his guilt of denying three, denying Jesus three times. Jesus asked him three times, Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. That's a hard thing to do if you are hurt by somebody to just give them the chance to give them the opportunity of forgiveness without really showing it without he come on what kind of betrayal is that to somebody somebody so close to you that denied you when you were about to die but yet just with the form of saying hey well do you love me yes i do do you love me yes i do do you love me yes i do to allow that as okay i believe you (laughs) that's 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 a genuine uh, a beauty. That's a genuine love. It's funny too because I, I think about it like we use that statement today. We use, hey, do you love me? Oh, why? What do you want? You down to give me the remote? You know, like oh, well, all right. You love me? Oh, okay. What? What do you want me to do? Oh, you think you can go to the store for me? Jesus did the same thing. He says, do you love me? Yes. Okay. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes. Okay. Feed my lambs. He did the same thing. So it's it's a kind of a funny little term, but uh, Jesus is a little more serious in that statement than what we bring it to. So the last thing I want to talk about, if I can find it in my notes, because I lost my spot and it's upside down. Um, It's going to be truth. This is evident, but not at the time. You know, we, we think about Jesus today and it's 2000 years later. We have the Bible which is what this point's going to be about, the Bible. But they didn't. They lived in this life. They lived in the time of Jesus. They lived in the time of the Messiah. So the form of resurrection, the, the, uh, the, uh, the account of resurrection to us, we take it as truth, but they seen it firsthand. 
And that's what this passage is about. They're seeing Jesus, but in a whole nother form. And right there, uh, it took Thomas to put his finger in Jesus' hands. And he said, truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Messiah. And what we have is this beautiful account, this beautiful account of called the Gospels as proof. The historical context is in here. But the, the form that Jesus takes is many. He uses his word. God uses his word. He uses prayer. He uses fasting. But Jesus is alive in the form of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. The Holy Spirit is here. So just like the, the disciples on the boat, on, <laughs> just like the disciples in the boat saw this man who they didn't notice, they didn't recognize, didn't know his voice, but then realized, I know him. That's not whoever this man was. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. So today... When we view Jesus as truth, when we view what what is truth? Truth is the possession of a real existence as a person, thing, or occurring as a fact. So when we see Jesus as a real person, when we see Jesus as a real existence, when we truly, truly say, you know what? I'm going to believe. That Jesus was real, is real, and is the answer, you will be in, you'll begin to see him. Or you'll begin to love him. When you learn about Jesus, when you learn the personhood that Jesus is, you will love him because he is nothing but good. He is nothing but uh, beauty. He's nothing but love. And when you love him, You'll see him. And when you see him, you'll pursue him. Because you know nothing else in this world matters most than pursuing Christ. He is our Redeemer. He is our Lord. He is my Savior. He is your Savior. He went to them on the boat. He didn't go wait for them to go in the synagogue He didn't wait for them to go into a place of worship. He didn't wait for them to have a prayer meeting. No, he went to them. So wherever you are at, Jesus will go where you you are. Jesus is where you think he may not be. I promise you that. Just like I saw the Colosseum, just like my experience of the Colosseum, where I've turned... And I seen from my very eyes a building, an amphitheater that proved the existence of all the stories in history that I heard about it. It became true to me. It became true so much that I brought something home. Uh, I, I, remember, I see this and I remember actually being there. The Bible, uh, the, the, the gospel, the message of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the message of God is so true and was and was so true to the, the authors of this that they provided something for us to believe. I look at my memento of this gladiator and I remember that I was there. I remember that. The Colosseum is real. This is my proof. You can take this as proof. Because if you do, I guarantee you, everything that we have talked about, everything you hear, everything you may have heard, will begin to be evident in your life. There's a lot of things in here that if you read, there's promises. There's accounts of creation. There's historical proven context of, uh, of, of so many things, things that happened in Jerusalem that have been proven, yeah, that really happened. Uh, there's so many, and there's, there's questionable things that people try to disprove. That's why not everybody believes, because there's so many people that try to disprove this, but this is powerful. 
But the personhood of Jesus, my friend, has been something recently that I'm beginning to fall in love with. Because uh, the more of me I focus on is the less of Jesus. I'm not beautiful, meaning in my nature. I'm not loving. And uh, I'm not truthful. Are you? <laughs> I felt like Mr. Rogers right there. Are you? But think about it. But the person that Jesus is and was when he lived on this earth was 100% beauty, 100% love, and 100% truth. And you can believe that this morning if you choose to. So right there where you're at, I, choose, uh, I, I, I challenge you if you can just close your eyes. And if you haven't chosen to believe the message of Jesus or even believe Jesus, um, you can make the decision right now. All you have to do is, is, uh, is, is proclaim it. And it's simple. And you can say, Jesus, I choose to believe in you. I choose to believe that you died on the cross and that you resurrected. That all my sins are forgiven through the blood that you shed. You truly are the Messiah and the fulfillment of prophecy. I commit my spirit to you this morning. Thank you. For, for thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I thank you and I love you. Amen. That's it. What do you do now? There is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they, every single book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has the account of what Jesus did on this earth, who Jesus is, how he's the fulfillment of prophecy, and you will begin to be in awe of this man that we call Jesus. So church, thank you. I was, I'm very nervous. I'm very nervous and I give all the glory to God. Uh, I'm sorry if some things didn't make sense. Um, I, I tried my hardest and I, I hope this message has spoke to you. I give all the glory and honor to God for what he's doing in my life, for what he's doing in our church, for what he's doing in our family. And I give him all the glory and all the praise and I love him with all my heart. Uh, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep swimming to him because I can see him moving. Be blessed and I'll see you next week.